I do wish the United States had cooperated on the raid in Abdabad so that things could have been di different for the doctor. It is against the law in any country in the world to cooperate with foreign intelligence. Look at the case of Jonathan Pollard here in the United States, where he too was um, cooperating with Israeli intelligence and was sentenced to life imprisonment by a U.S. court. And despite all efforts by Israeli politicians, and they've been unable to secure his release. Yes. The U.S. is now making some question about aid to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, is this simply one more level of the deterioration in the relationship? Uh, yes, it's one of, 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 a, of a series of crises that we've had to face over the past year. Everything from the Raymond Davis fiasco, where a uh, CIA agent in Pakistan shot right. two innocent Pakistanis in the back in the streets of Lahore, to the s recent uh, border incident where uh, the NATO troops uh, killed 24 innocent Pakistani soldiers, and that didn't result in an apology. It has not resulted in has, an apology. Has not resulted in an apology to obviously the Abdabad raid. So there, are, there have been some contentious issues that have resulted in a deterioration of our relationship. So how can you rebuild it? I think both sides are working together to resolve these issues. I think the way we can rebuild it is by increasing cooperation rather than increasing the conflict. And that requires an understanding on both sides. It requires an understanding on Pakistan's side to see the, the anger, the genuine anger and, and misunderstanding here in the United States. And it requires an understanding on the American side to see the genuine frustration in Pakistan, where we believe our sacrifices in this war aren't being appreciated and the efforts that we make to fight this war aren't being appreciated and, and our limited capacity vis-a-vis -vis the United States is also not being appreciated. I just did a conversation with the former Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates. Uh, and I asked him, did, was it inconceivable of him to believe that Pakistani intelligence service, ISI, did not know about Osama bin Laden? Mm -hmm. He said it's inconceivable to him mm -hmm. that somebody didn't know, mm -hmm. uh, but they had no evidence. What do you think? I think that's that's a that's a strange answer because that that that's an accusation without any proof. Um, when the United States raided the Abdabad compound, they found a treasure trove of evidence that suggested Osama bin Laden lived there for a while. I believe that if there was any link between Osama bin Laden and the intelligence agencies or anyone in the government of Pakistan, there would have been some form of evidence. I mean, if they managed to find him there, mm -hmm. then they'd be able to manage to unearth some sort of evidence to prove the link. Do you accept there's some link between ISI and not necessarily the top of it, but some link between ISI and the Haqqani group? How would you define link? I think security agencies all around the world have contact with unsavory characters. I don't, not to my knowledge and not to my belief, there is there an active link with anyone in the ISI, not even in the bottom to the top, but I can't claim to be an expert. I don't engage with... Do you accept the premise that the Afghan war has not gone as well as it might have because there was a constant flow of Taliban from and protection in Pakistan who had come across the border into Afghanistan uh, easily and I, could join Taliban forces already there. I think there are many reasons why the Afghan war um, hasn't gone particularly well. Um, and I think the main reason is uh, there was a distraction halfway through where all attention was focused to Iraq. And there was a pitiful number of American forces in Afghanistan. Excuse the word pitiful. Yeah. It's the, the, uh, Fair uh, enough, I In comparison to the attention that was paid um, to Iraq. And I think that's the key. The attention wasn't there. When you started to pay attention again, it, had already, it was coming close to the 10-year mark and people are getting impatient. And then you decided to leave in 2014 I think that's more the problem. And it is a very long border. It's a very porous border. I mean, if you can't seal the border with Mexico, it's a lot more treacherous. It's a lot more difficult mm -hmm. for the Pakistani Af Afghan border. And as I said, we have 140,000 active Pakistani military troops at the border. Um, but there's an anvil problem on both sides, I think. I think there is this, for some reason, and I can't tell you why, we feel like when we, sh we launched, if you remember, when we came into power,
the US networks were reporting about how the Taliban had taken over areas of Pakistan and they were a couple of miles away from the capital and the nuclear arsenal was under threat, that area in Fatah and Swat, etc. We cleared of the Taliban. But we feel that when we cleared them from there, they went and sought sanctuary in Afghanistan and there wasn't that anvil effect where, they, where the American forces were stopping them from coming in. And perhaps that's the same problem the American, feel, uh, American feels towards Pakistan. But again, we see it as a capacity problem. Here is what is the, here is the assumption about Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, it's on your border. And you worry about when NATO forces and American forces leave, uh, who might come to power there, and you want to make sure they are friendly to Pakistan? Um, I, uh, the pres Afghan President Mohammed Kar uh, Karzai and Pakistani President Zadari have an extremely close re relationship. Both our governments get along great. Um, the president of Afghanistan came to my father's um, oath-taking ceremony. My father went to President Karzai's oath-taking ceremony. You had them both in your show for an interview. Yeah. Our relationships couldn't be better. That's why we believe that it should be an Afghan-led and Afghan-owned reconciliation process in Afghanistan. And the resulting peace, whatever it may be, as long as it's a peaceful, prosperous, stable Afghanistan, is in the interest of Pakistan. Uh, we don't want to change the makeup. Karzai is no longer in office after 2014. I mean, are you concerned about a destabilized Afghanistan with Taliban forces coming to power? I would be concerned over in Afghanistan where the extremist forces did come to power. Do you worry about the influence of India in Afghanistan? No. You don't? I do not. What's the nature of the relationship today because of all the conflict over the Kashmir? Um, our, the nature of the relationship today is vastly improving, actually. It's, it's, it's very heartening for me. I just went on a trip to India with my father, and it wasn't just the Indian right. government and the Indian prime minister. It was also the opposition party's president present at that um, event. If you look over the border in Pakistan, it's not just my party that has always talked about peace with India. In fact, my mother talked about peace in India in 1988 when she invited Ravi, Rajiv Gandhi to Pakistan and was declared a security threat by the opposition at the time. That very same opposition today talks about peace with India. I think peace with India has moved beyond a sort of intellectual elite desire to uh, every common man desire. Notwithstanding uh, the fact that the Mumbai attacks originated from Pakistan. Those are non-state actors. I, people are always going to try and say, I believe the Mumbai attacks took place to sabotage the vast strides we made as soon as my father took over with the peace process with India in order to sabotage our relationship. Why do have so many, um, you know, we're getting ready to face, look at some trials, military trials for uh, Sheikh Mohammed uh, and others who were involved mm -hmm. in 9-11. They, most of them were captured in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Osama bin Laden was killed in mm -hmm. Pakistan. Mm -hmm. What is it about Pakistan? Well, I would ask you, what was it about Afghanistan? That's where they were, I believe, and we're, we're a country... Well, they were given... i tell you what it was about Afghanistan. Uh, Mullah Omar I gave mean, them safe haven. But after, but after the Americans came and, and you had vast success in Afghanistan and thought it was, the situation was so great that another war could be launched, there was still Taliban in Afghanistan. And even after 10 years, after a trillion dollar war, there's still Taliban in Afghanistan. Do you think the war, the, that the United States made a grievous mistake in shifting its focus to Iraq? Yes, I do. And if they stayed in Afghanistan, we'd have a different Afghanistan today? I believe if they stayed the focus just on Afghanistan. If the focus had stayed at Afghanistan, if the focus had stayed on uh, democracy, not just in Afghanistan and all over the region, I think there was too much was left for a, a military dictator to do, mm -hmm. and uh, it, there's, there's always a broader than just a military solution to every problem. There's also a political uh, solution that I think politicians could have brought to the table. And with the politicians isolated in Pakistan, the situation was different. Back to Osama bin Laden, how long do you think he was there? I don't know. 
I, I can tell you, I honestly believe... Your father is president of the country. Yes, my father is president of the country. I believed he was dead. And you're chairman of the party. Yes, and I believed he was dead. Uh, I you chairman believed the, he was dead? My father was... Yes, I believed he was dead. My father is president of Pakistan right now. But, however, he spent 11 and a half years as a political prisoner in Pakistan as well before that. So uh, forgive us if we didn't know the where Osama bin Laden was hiding. Well, no, no the question level, is not that you did not know. The question is uh, how could it have happened because you now have access uh, to the people who were, in fact, in power in terms of the military and in terms of ISI. Mm -hmm. So and, the and, whole national security apparatus and, hasn't changed that much. And, and they did not, though. But however, we have established a very powerful commission in Pakistan that is determined to come to the truth to, of the matter. Hmm. So I am confident that we will find out what happened, how long was he there for, how did he manage to stay there for so long, etc. If indeed he was there for that long. What's Pakistan's relationship with China, China today? Um, I think it's a positive relationship. Our relationship with all the countries in our region are improving. Hmm. And that's a very positive step. Because as soon as the outside problems decrease, as soon as your external relationships get better, the more you can look internally and address the internal concerns. Therefore, it's a very positive thing that our relationship with Afghanistan has increased so drastically, the peace process with India is progressing, our relationship with China is positive, and that's why I would like the relationship with the United States to improve better as well so that we can look internally without forces inside pointing to the bogeyman outside the is country. Is that part of the reason you were here? That is part of the reason why I'm here. Did yeah. you meet with former Ambassador Haqqani? Uh, no, I didn't get you. I don't believe he's in D.C. at the moment. I don't know he's in and out, I think. He's not in Pakistan, is he, or is he? Uh, no, he's not in Pakistan at the yeah. moment. What's his status? What do you mean by status? Is he is he been indicted? Is he under any kind of detention? Can he no, travel no, no, as much as he wants to? He's, he's there were serious charges that against him that he had they, talked to the American military about having conversations with the Pakistani military. Um, Those are all facts, aren't they? No. No. Tell me which ones are wrong. I I I don't want. I can't. This the the court case is still gone, ongoing, okay. so I don't want to get into too much detail. Well, well, then the court case is about. to say that I believe Hussein Akani was innocent. Fair enough. Okay. okay. He's uh, a friend? Uh, he's a friend of democracy in Pakistan and a friend of... Uh, a the long family? He, he actually, in fact, used to work for our political rivals. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, is, he came up with the nickname Mr. 10% um, <laughs> for my father <laughs> while he worked for them. So that did not make uh, him thought... No. In your family. Uh, he however, gone. he fell out and was arrested and tortured uh, in prisons in Pakistan and has since then made a shift towards a belief in a democratic Pakistan and strive mm. for a democratic He has been Pakistan. in Washington. Yes, he has been in Washington. He was a very effective ambassador. No, no, after yeah. that, after this whole business arose in Pakistan, I think he has been he has in been back Washington. Because yeah. the, the case is now ongoing. Um, I think that some of the more, more absurd accusations of that were flushed out in our media, and there was a lot of hype around it, and there was a lot of confusion. It was more, it was a, it's a very complicated issue. Um, and it's, it's hard, really, to convey to someone in the West, because I believe it would not have been an issue anywhere else. Um, the man, there, there's supposedly a memo that he was to have drafted. Yeah. Then it turned out, no, the, the man making the accusations admits that he drafted it. Right. Uh, this was a Pakistani? But on the instructions. Is this very, no, right. this was an American citizen. Oh, I see. Uh, it, it's a very complex and issue. General Jones was connected to this as well. Uh, General Jones has completely... Uh, he passed said, on something, didn't he? Uh, uh, he was accused of something like that, but he's, he's given an affidavit in, the case, affidavit in the case, and a man making the accusations does not have any credibility, okay, and this is quite ridiculous. It's a small point, but it, nevertheless, I, you know, being in Washington, yeah. uh, you do have a new ambassador who is much admired. Yeah. Uh, you, specifically you, tell me of the influence of your mother. On me or on mm -hmm. the country? On you, first. Um, she was, she was, she was my everything. And you don't, I, you really, uh, people say this, but you don't appreciate something until it's gone. The, mm -hmm. the unconditional love of a mother is impossible to replace. Um, and it's why at 19 I was ha happy to run for election as chairman of my party. Um, and I was happy to take this burden on because men go to war and are killed. They don't know what it's like when they kill your mother. Mm. They don't know what's coming. Who killed her? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated conspiracy. Um, that they, and heartfelt. Yeah, there's been a, a UN investigation which had a, a limited mandate, but that carried out its job. And then there was a Pakistani investigation into the case, and now the case is before the courts. 
um, what it is the, the investigation has concluded, both investigations have concluded is that al-Qaeda issued the instructions to Tariqi Taliban in Pakistan who carried out the attacks and that the dictator at the time, although aware of the attacks, Mr. Mashara. Yes. Provided, and this is my belief, purposely provided inadequate security, which amounts to sabotage. Did Sab they withdraw the security or never provided it? They never, even the UN report says they never provided act, the appropriate security for a former prime minister of the country. His own former prime minister said more security. Forget about all the other threats. Yeah. The very basic security you provide to a former prime minister was not awarded to her. So it's my belief he purposely sabotaged the security. He was aware of the specific attacks against her and wanted her eliminated. So he did less rather than more knowing that there was an attack planned against her. Yes. Did she have a sense of it? Um, I don't. I, she, she, she was aware of the threats. Um, but general or specific? General. I believe that he was aware of specifics. They did, as the UN report said, they did nothing more than become aware of the threats and pass on a message basically saying, there is a threat against your life. Don't go here. Don't go there. And it was almost every day. But they knew the specifics of the threat. And they didn't... A, rather they didn't, than simply telling her they should have done something a, they to should eliminate have, the, a, the a, threat. Exactly. As the government of Pakistan, you go after the threat. You, a, you, you provide adequate security, first of all, and B, when there's a specific threat, you put everything in your power to go and catch them. Where were you when she was killed? Uh, I was in Dubai. You were in Dubai? I just uh, finished my first eight weeks at Oxford and we had a Christmas break. Uh, and I came over to Dubai and she came over to meet us for a couple of days and then she'd gone back to Pakistan. Hmm. So she'd seen you right before yes. she went back. Uh, she was on this program a number of times, as you may know, uh, several times. And here is one time. 1995, talking about the influence mm -hmm. of your grandfather and her father, uh, also a former prime minister who was hanged. Here it is. What's the legacy of your father for you? Humanism. I think really he was a humanist, and he followed a different path towards the goal of humanism. And for me, it's social uh, development, it's human resource development, which is important. So all the politics takes part. But I really get happy when I go to a village and see that we've electrified it and the people there are seeing light burn for the first time in the night. I get happy if I go and see that a lady health worker has been trained and she's talking to the women in the communities about planning their families, reducing infant mortality rate. That's what gives one satisfaction. It, was he the most profound influence on you? Very much so. I think he gave me the confidence to be a person in my own right. I come from a very traditional society. Did he imagine you were ever going into politics? Or would that well, not have happened without his... He would always say that my daughter is going to make me more proud than Indira Gandhi made her father. And I'd say, no, Papa, I'm not going to go into politics. That's never going to happen. Why it did happened. you do it then? I did it because he was in prison. Uh, all the party leaders were behind bars. And I felt uh, it was a grave injustice to him. And I got motivated and committed not only for fighting for his life, but fighting for a democratic society, which he had envisaged as the first step to social emancipation. When you see that, you, it must call back all kinds of memories of, of her as a mother and as a powerful political force. Yes. She... Um as I said, you don't realize what you've lost until it's gone. And I, you know, despite all the threats, despite what a big decision this was, um, it just wasn't going to happen. She was going to be safe. It, it, for some reason, I can't explain why, but they couldn't hurt her. Mm. It, it just, it couldn't, it, it wasn't meant to happen. And yet she stood up in that car. She always did, after every rally. The security was, took that into account. Um, what would happen was she'd stand up in the car, the car would drive off. In this case, the police were sent away on purpose so that the crowds would surround the car, so that the car would be in, unable to move. 
I think it's really str this, this was a, a very interesting argument for me that oh she stood up so she deserved to die. I've never heard this before. No, I have. You, you know, not with male. Kennedy should have had his top down. He deserved to die. So they said that. They did. She they, deserved they were, they to were die people, because she stood up. They, because she stood up, she deserved to die. They. It, mm, Anyway, Martin Luther King didn't wear a bulletproof vest. Your he deserved is, to die. It's clear. And anyway. She also, as you know, I interviewed her several months before she went back in an interview that was not recorded before a group mm -hmm. of, at a conference uh, in Aspen, Colorado, and there was no rec no, it was not recorded. What was there about her was this sheer sense that she understood there was danger, but that she could not, her country needed her to come now. And she had weighed the danger and decided that she had to go. Yes, very much so. Almost as it, w it was her destiny. And not not to, to be assassinated, but to play a role in her country at that moment. She was our country's best hope. She was our region's best hope. The whole narrative of Al-Qaeda is loaned to smithereens when the popularly elected prime minister of a Muslim country is a woman. Did that bullet change your life in terms of your life's projection? Absolutely. I was an undergraduate who just started university. Uh, just as she'd said over there, unlike her father, she, uh, she, she groomed us well, but not specifically for politics. Uh, she thought education was very important, and she wanted us to have the freedom she didn't have. She wanted us to be able to make our own choices in life. Mm -hmm. um, and it... I think there's an interview somewhere as well where she says that, and she says that, that exactly that, that we will make our own choices and I'm going to go to university. She'd always say this. I'll go off to university, then I have to go get a job. No, I have to go to one university. I have to go to Oxford first, yeah. then Harvard. She told this to you. Yeah, Oxford, you go to Oxford, Harvard. Then Harvard Law yeah. School or undergraduate or I Kennedy School? Specifics or it, it, was, it was Oxford. She did Oxford. Harvard and Oxford, but right. I was to do Oxford, Harvard, get a job, get married, start a family, and then, if I so wish, I can come back um, to Pakistan. Um, and that became impossible so the day she was assassinated. Then you went back to Pakistan immediately? Absolutely, yeah. And what's your future now? You're head of the party. Are you waiting your opportunity to run for um, president? No, not to run for president. I mean, but uh, my, um, I'm, I'm, I am head of the party, but at the same time, I didn't campaign in the last election. Um, I didn't seek office for myself, nor did I campaign for my party. So I don't particularly uh, feel like I have a mandate at the moment to take an overactive role, to step on anybody's toes. Um, so when the next election comes around, and if the party so wishes, I will be taking a more active role. In what way? Uh, in, in campaigning, in engaging in policy, in engaging in issues, in being part of the debate in our society for a peaceful, prosperous, and is there someone in Pakistan other than you and other than your father who speaks to those people who had such belief in your mother? Um, there are few and far between. And it's not that the people who don't share the ideology, it's getting increasingly more dangerous to speak the way my mother did the way my grandfather did. We've had a couple of other political assassinations um, since then. The, uh, uh, our party's governor in the Punjab, the largest province of Pakistan, was also shot and killed by his own security guards for his beliefs. We uh, had elect Our party had appointed the first ever Christian federal minister in our country's history. It was a very proud moment for us. He too was assassinated. I, I wouldn't like to say there aren't people out there who advocate for the same beliefs as my, as my mother and my grandfather and our party does, and there are a lot of brave people in our party, but we're few and far between and we're being cut down one by one. Whether it's actual assassination or political, and a political assassination in the sense that our reputations are being gone after, you're you're being muddied, you're being brought down. Look at what happened to Abbas de Haqqani, who was also a strong voice for a democratic, egalitarian Pakistan. And so do you assume attacks will come against you? Um, attacks may come against me, 
but I am also both called. violent or simply uh, to oh both, both from both sides. Um, but I also believe that the Pakistani state will do everything it can to provide me the security I need. Um, and <laughs> threats do come against me, but as I said, I've lost the most valuable thing in my life. Your mother. Yeah. So those threats don't scare me. What's your relationship today with General Kayani? I, I don't have a relationship with, you don't. with, with General Kayani. You don't know him. You're the son of Benazir Bhutto? Yeah, but I, I, I'm, I'm... You're chairman of a party? I, I'm, tra I'm chairman of a political party in the army. You uh, don't army. meet him? You've never had conversations I, with I, him? I, I have met him, uh, but, but I don't have a relationship with him, and that's no. very important because the military is part of the government, and it's only elected representatives, and they're, they're supreme commander of the armed forces, my father. Those people have relationships with the, with the chief of army staff. Not Will Musharraf have done what he did without General Kanyani knowing it? Well, I believe it's entirely impossible. Impossible. Possible. Possible. Yes. That Musharraf acted in some way without the chief of a, a high-ranking military official, either at ISI or at yes, the chief of staff of the army, absolutely. doing it. Absolutely. Knowing it. Musharraf was the all-powerful dictator of Pakistan. He wants to come back. Yes. Well, I, uh, I'm looking. We've approached Interpol to issue a red warrant. So if he wants to come back of his own free will, please do, so he can face the charges of the role he played in the assassination of my mm. mother. How safe are the nuclear weapons? Very safe. We have a very effective command and control system um, to keep them safe. The we nuclear weapons that I am very concerned about are the nu loose nukes after the Cold War. That were from left Russia. From Russia's retreat and in those right, countries. Right. Those are very wonderful. But the, in Pakistan, they're very, very secure. And how, how unstable is Pakistan? I believe we're a new democracy. And we it, it might not look it now, but the progress that we have made is making us an even more stable country. Mm. As we get more democratic, it, 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 democracy is a funny thing that way. Just because people are allowed to protest, the media is allowed to speak their mind, the judiciary is allowed to play an active role, it can look like your country is descending more into chaos. In, in fact, we're becoming stronger as a result. For example, I believe it would be near to impossible for there to be a military coup in Pakistan today. Nearly impossible. Yeah, I would 99.99% impossible. And if it was, the pressure would be so much that we'd we'd end it almost immediately as well. Well, General Kanyani has has a number of times said he does not want to see the military play a political role. Yes, and like you I, take him at his word. Yeah, he's a, he's a. Uh, I have no reason not to. Uh, we've. We've been in power for the past five years. As I said, I don't have a relationship with him, but my, the, the officials in my party who are in elective uh, positions do. He's always come out and voiced strong support for democracy. Um, so I have no reason to believe that he sh would not. What is it that you want America to understand about Pakistan today that perhaps I have not asked the appropriate question to, to, to precipitate that answer? I would like America to understand that my mother did not sacrifice her life for Pakistan to be told we are not doing enough. We play our part, and it's not just my mother. We've lost 37,000 of our own civilians to this war. As I said, 6,300 security forces have died, which is six times the casualties of NATO in Afghanistan. We have more forces on the border than they have in all of Afghanistan. We're doing our pa part. We don't lack the will, we lack the means. I understand the frustration that's there. I understand that they have to leave in 2014. But we, we're going to be Afghanistan's neighbors forever. And India as well. And India as well, which is why we're working on our relationships with them. You understand how the United States worries about Pakistan? I do. They, they, they have concerns. Uh, but I feel like the hostilities between the two countries mean that we have less ability to convey each other the size of both of our problems. It's all the, the, the accusations. And when it's just accusations, you don't get the, the, the t chance to explain more to properly mm. how to solve these things, how to address the problems, whether they're legitimate concerns or not legitimate concerns. Uh, before we go, I want to show you an excerpt, not you, show the audience an excerpt from the documentary Buto. It just won a Peabody Award, a very, very prestigious 
journalistic award. Here it is. She got the same sort of receptions everywhere, wherever she went in Karachi. A bigger reception than in Pindi. She got an equally impressive reception. And the crowd was so emotionally charged that she could have just asked them to take over and uh, lynch Zia, but she, she didn't because she believed that she has to restore the sanctity of vote over bullet. But my party did not want bloodshed. My party does not want violence. And we again repeated that hear the call of the people and give us a date for immediate election. Benazir Bhutto today challenged you before leaving Karachi to a election showdown. Could you please give us your reaction? Chivalry forbids me to challenge a lady. <laughs> <laughs> who was the last spokesman? He's General Sial Haq, the man who murdered, uh, uh, who'd assassinated her grandfather, uh, and was the military dictator she was fighting against. And I believe the interview where they asked the question is Christina Lamb, who gets up and asks. Okay. And he says that. Uh, as we were watching that, you said to me. Oh, I, I'm, it's along the lines about how she was the best hope for Pakistan. Uh, in this war against Islamic extremism. When she went to the northern areas of Pakistan, to what is now Khaybar Bakhtun Khwa, uh, and during the campaign, kids from the madrasas would come out, and she told me this herself when she came to visit me in, in Dubai, that they came out and lined the treat streets and were chanting, Ben is your, you will be our, fo our sword, we will defeat these people. Mm. She was also a very strong and vocal proponent for the empowerment of women. Yes. I am so very proud of our government's achievements on that front. We've done more to address that issue than any of our previous governments combined. We've passed more women's rights legislation than any of our previous governments combined. And my most favorite program that we've started is the Bernazir Income Support Program, which is Pakistan's first and only social safety net. It serves the dual role of women's emancipation and poverty alleviation, and has lifted four million families out of poverty by providing a tiny monthly stipend to, to the women in the households of the poorest of the poor. Mm. Uh, it's good to have you here. I hope we can have another conversation either in Pakistan or, or, or back here at this table or in Washington. But thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Malawa Bhutto. Sadari, his father is the president of Pakistan. His mother was Benazir Bhutto. Uh, he is chairman of the Pakistani People's Party. Back in a moment. Stay with us.